Hello, uh, welcome to Frank's School. This is the 22nd day of, of Advent. Uh, uh, and uh, first of all, I want to apologize for the light and the focus. I, 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 don't, know, I, I don't know if I'll ever get it down right. Uh, so anyway, sorry about that. And, and the other thing I wanted to say about Away in a Manger, the word asleep, when I was analyzing it, asleep. It came from at sleep. That's how, there were a lot of words actually that that, that happened. Uh, if they start with a, at sleep, th they became uh, a single adjective, a single word in modern English. All right. Well, anyway, I, I had said that you couldn't guess what what the last. I've only got after today. I've only got three left uh, in the Advent calendar, and then it's Christmas. Uh, you couldn't have guessed, and you still couldn't guess what what the ones are that I've saved for last. Uh, this one you couldn't guess because virtually nobody knows it. Almost nobody. Uh, unknown. Uh, and I went out of the hymnal. I said I cheated. I went out of the Lutheran red hymnal and I went to this hymnal. Now, it was written by A. H. Ackley, copyright 1934. He's an American. Uh, and uh, he wrote it for Roadheaver, I guess, is the publishing company. And, and this hymnal triumphant service songs, it says, this hymnal was so uh, uh, influential, I think, in America, all kinds of little country churches used it in their Sunday schools, independent churches, uh, and uh, there's a whole vast body of, of uh, hymns that are known in America and loved, but they didn't work their way into the mainline hymnals, and this is one of them. Um, Ackley, he might have write, written, he wrote hymns by the hundreds, and Road Heaver, I mean, this was a, a money-making business. Uh, they, they just cranked out hymns after hymns after hymns, and some of them were pretty good. Uh, but anyway, this one, although virtually nobody knows it, here it, it's not even in the middle of a Christmas section, uh, it's, and yet it's about Christmas. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it was odd, but, but I found it. I, in a way, I feel like I've discovered it. To show you how rare it is, I, I put into, oh, list to the story that never grows old, I put it in quotes, and I uh, Googled it, and I think I came up with seven, seven hits of that whole phrase. And of those seven, I think maybe only four had it there. And, you know, I, I sort of despaired. I thought, well, I'll go on YouTube. Maybe somebody has sung it. And, and there, is a, there is a song, The Story That Never Grows Old, I think. There, there is that that's been done. Uh, but not this one. It, it's not there on YouTube. So, swallow hard. I'm going to sing it. Uh, I'm going to sing it for you here. So it, it will be on YouTube. I'm not going to sing the whole thing. Because I'm, I'm not a good singer. I'm not a good guitar player. But, but here I've got the guitar. So. Fair warning, uh, but anyway, before I do that, let's look at the uh, let's look at the poem. Oh, listen to the story that never grows old. Its tidings of joy repeat. The Savior has come by the prophets foretold to Bethlehem's quiet street. The miracle star shines in splendor above the stable, so dingy and worn, so worn, so humble a cradle for one who is loved. But there, Jesus Christ was born. Very simple. Which is one of the reasons I like it. Uh, but it's also in triple time. Look at this. Oh, listen to the story that never grows old. I, I found it, and uh, this year I'm not going to do it. Uh, I thought I was going to do it, but maybe next year. There is another whole body of Christmas carols that were forgotten. Uh, they were before the uh, English Civil War. They were too cheerful. They were too happy. You could dance to them. And the Puritans in England found that offensive. They were actually outlawed for a while in uh, about 1650 to 1660. You, you couldn't go around dancing in public, and you, and you couldn't be having singing songs that you could dance to. And they ended up being forgotten. So almost all of these carols that we use now come out of the Victorian period, either translations from German or new work from the Victorian period, which was some 200 years later. But I find that this has that spirit of the, um, 
I almost want to say Renaissance uh, time. Uh, it, it, you could you could so easily dance to this. It's tidings of joy repeat. Now, right here, there's an empty spot. But this is common verse. Uh, well, uh, yeah, it's go A B A B. The Savior is come by the prophets foretold to Bethlehem's quiet street. And even there, that's the same. I, I think this man, actually, I don't know about his other work. I, I, I think he did come up with a few others that are, are widely known. I'm, I'm sure he did. Not this one. The miracle star shines in splendor above. Look at this. The miracle star shines in splendor above the stable. So, <laughs> look at this alliteration going on. Um, and another thing, here's, uh, it would be a good test for you. What's that called when you can't stop here for the sense of it? In, in splendor above the stable. That's called enjambment. Uh, you need to go right on. So dingy and worn. So worn. Now, now this, uh, the, the fact that that's repeated, it just says something about music in America in the early 20th century uh, in these country churches. People love to sing a certain kind of, of hymn, and in a way, that's an in indication of it. So humble a cradle for one who is loved, but there Jesus Christ was born. Now, what I, I'll, I'll show you, uh, I'll, I'll read the other uh, verses. Uh, there's two other verses, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to pick out a sentence to diagram it, uh, but, uh, because there's one in particular that I, I really like. But anyway, let me, let me show you how this goes. It's just a three chord song. It's also so simple. I'll probably get it all wrong. But. Oh, listen to the story that never grows old. It's tidings of joy repeat. The Savior is come by the prophets foretold to Bethlehem's quiet street. The miracle star shines in splendor above the stable, so dingy and worn, so worn, so humble, a cradle for one who is loved. There Jesus Christ was born. <laughs> I can get to three by going with my thumb, jink, jink. That's one of the reasons I decided to go ahead with the guitar. Oh, let me just go on. I could do this in a second shot, but... Yeah, I, actually, I'm going to take a. I'm going to do a second shot because I want to race the board and write uh, at least the uh, the third stanza up here. So see you real soon. Well, here's the here's the second verse. I'll just I'll just read it to you. Uh, you can find the the text on, online if you want. The swift beating wings of the angels bring fear and scurry the sheep in fright, but glad of the honor are spirits who hear and seek for the better light. The awe-stricken shepherds with staff in their hands kneel down in the manger so dim, so dim, and worshiping kings from the Orient lands find wonder and rest in him. And the third verse goes like this, and I think this is inspired. Uh, I don't care if this is a sort of a humble, common <laughs> hymn or book. I think here he was inspired. The world is so dull and the world is so dead with ribaldry, pomp, and gain. And like the foul stable where cattle are fed, so life has become profane. Still travails the heart in the birth of a king, more strange than the wandering star, the star. The word becomes flesh, an incredible thing, but truest of things that are. Uh, the world is so dull, and the world is so dead. Well, here's alliteration. <clears throat> It, 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 but uh, and and I wish, uh, and I'll talk about the 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 words and, and stuff. But it's also the thought, ribaldry. You know, when when I've had choirs sing this or in church, they've never seen this word before. Ribaldry, the, the ribaldry. What, what is this? They don't know what to say. They've never seen it. Ribaldry. Well, if you're ribald, you're you're like the carols before the uh, English Puritans. Uh, you're rowdy. <laughs> you're drinking, you're dancing, you're carrying on. I mean, that should be fun. But this man says, no, that's dull. That's dull and dead ribaldry. You know, it's reactionary, I guess. You know, I, I look at the, this was copyrighted in 1934, you know, and, and that's like, 
it, the depression had occurred uh, was occurring uh, the roaring 20s in America you know with ribaldry pomp pomp is all this fancy stuff of getting dressed up and marching and big ceremony but uh, uh, these are words see that, that a lot of times people don't know and gain they know about gain making money but that's dull that's dead <laughs> And life, and, and like the foul stable where cattle are fed, so life has become profane. I mean, the guy is launching into philosophy almost here. Uh, you know, I have a fascination with the Mennonites, um, evident because of the ad hoc choir, but, but beyond that, the way they think, um, because in many ways, uh, when you try to describe Mennonites or Amish, you think, well, it's like a hundred years ago, but I think they they would say that's right. Uh, that's not well. Anyway, still travails the heart in the birth of a king. Well, this word travail, you have to go, still travels the heart. You've got to put the accent there. Travail is work. It's hard work, but it also comes meant labor. Uh, a woman's labor giving birth was tra uh, travail. And the heart travails in the birth of a king. This is inspired poetry, I think. More strange than the wandering star. The star, of course, referring to the star of Bethlehem. The word becomes flesh, an incredible thing, but truest of things that are. Now here, this is like a pun. Does this mean things that exist? You know, in English, you only say are. In 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 Portuguese, in Spanish, and the Romance languages, I think in general, there's, there's really two ways to say this. Uh, does it mean truest of things that are true, or truest of things that exist? <laughs> we can say exist in English. Um, it just inspired, I think. Um, <clears throat> now that didn't go so bad, so let, let me let me sing this one for you too. Uh, why not? <laughs> I'm, I'm not proud. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I really do like this. The world is so dull, dull, and the world is so dead with ribaldry, pomp, and gain. And like the foul stable where cattle are fed, so life has become profane. Still travels the heart in the birth of a king, more strange than the wandering star, the star. The word becomes flesh, an incredible thing, the truest of things that are. One, two, three, four. See, you could just dance to that so easily. Um, okay, uh, now, the sentence I'm going to tackle is... is uh, 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 <laughs> so, this is my favorite sentence. Well, I like it all. But I'm going to... I'm going to... I'm going to pick it up right here, instead of, instead of doing... That, that, that's sort of too easy. And like the foul stable where cattle are fed. Now, I haven't diagrammed this yet, so I'm not positive I can do this. Uh, well, in the first place, let's find a simple subject, a simple predicate. Life has become profane. That's what's going on. Life, life has become, oops, uh, it has become profane. Uh, and it has, and here we go with the interesting part, life has become profane. And the and would just come from up here. And, oops, that's where it starts. And life has become profane. But like, it has done this, like, um, like the false table. <laughs> I may be in trouble here. Uh, like uh, stable, uh, stable, the, the foul stable, where cattle, cattle are fed, there's the passive voice, where the foul, uh, like the, or well, like it goes here. Like the table where cattle are fed. See, the problem is what to do with the word so. And. And life has become profane like the foul stable where cattle are fed. 
I, I guess what I would do with it here, and I'm not actually positive this is right. I would say so, like, I would say this is what's called a uh, correlative preposition. Sometimes you've got two words that work together as a single part of speech, but they are separated, like either you go or you don't. Either or would be a correlative conjunction. Well, here, this is a, I would say this is a correlative, uh, a correlative uh, preposition. Ah, okay, well, <laughs> sure glad that's over because I was nervous about singing. If there had been an option on YouTube or if my, if I'd had the ad hoc choir sing it, that, believe me, I, 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 if I'd had enough of these hymnals that they would have loved to sing it. They would have learned it instantly and they would have loved to have sung that, I'm sure. Um, all right, well, <laughs> we've got three more uh, days to go and then it's Christmas. See you next time.